I'm Najaswat for biznews.com and joining me today is Dr. Mark Pimentel, a gastroenterologist and the executive director of the Cedar sinai Medically Associated Science and Technology Program in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Pimentel, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So before you ended up at Cedar sinai which for non-Americans is the hospital, the Hollywood hospital that we see in any, any true Hollywood story or movie, what is your medical background? Well, I, I'm a gastroenterologist, so I studied the digestive system and graduated in and around the late 1990s. So I'm dating myself, but that's, uh, and I've been here at Cedar sinai ever since, and we're number two in the U.S. by U.S. News and World Reports, so not just a Hollywood hospital anymore. That's impressive. So the topic of today's interview is irritable bowel syndrome. So while IBS is, of course, a real disorder, if you ask most people to define IBS, they can't. And so there's this growing suspicion that IBS is the go-to diagnosis for doctors when they can't figure out What's the matter with their patients? Can you explain to me in a way that layman can layman persons can understand what IBS is and what sets this disorder apart from other gastroenterological disorders? Well, <clears throat> first of all, irritable bowel syndrome affects almost 1 billion people worldwide. So this is not a rare condition by any means. It's the most common gastrointestinal disorder in the world. Um, so in the 1990s and before, there was this impression that IBS was due to a psychological problem or due to stress or anxiety. And because there was no biomarker, there was no understanding of the true cause of IBS, you're right, it was the leftovers. So you would look for Crohn's disease, which is a real condition. You would look for celiac disease, which is a real condition. And then IBS would be left over and you'd say, well, it must be IBS, which is not a real condition because there's nothing we know that causes it. So that's the 1990s. But we're now in 2022. We have blood tests for IBS. It's caused by food poisoning. It's a real disease uh, that we didn't you know, have before. So from where do you think the theory and conclusion that IBS is a psychosomatic disorder originated and why has it not been more fiercely challenged and looked into? Well, yeah, medicine doctors have a tradition of when we don't understand a condition, we say it's due to stress or anxiety. Uh, let's rewind to the early 1970s, 1960s. If you had a heart attack, uh, you end up in the hospital for a month. And now you don't end up in the hospital for a month, but you end up in the hospital for a month. You can't walk. You can't do anything. You're the CEO of a company. You have to quit because the stress is killing you. Uh, no, but it actually turns out it was the steakhouses, the alcohol, and the smoking that was killing you, um, not the CEO stressful position. So I think we're always attributing stress when we don't understand the nature of a condition. And that's where we got into a trap. Now, now stress does affect the bowel. We all know this when we're under extreme stress, we might have the butterflies or uh, maybe even loose bowel movements just for that day, but it's not a chronic condition. Hmm. To what extent, if any, do you think that the resistance to move beyond the psychosomatic belief of IBS as a disorder was challenged by the food industry? Uh, well, I think the low FODMAP diet challenges this a little bit. <clears throat> you're probably familiar or your, uh, your viewers are probably familiar with that. That's part of the transition of that IBS is due to your gut and due to the bacteria of your gut. That's part of the story. Because the more you ferment in the gut, the more gas and bloating you produce and the more symptoms you have in irritable bowel syndrome. I probably should say what IBS is, I, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, irritable bowel Please. syndrome is a chronic uh, medical condition of the digestive system where you have abdominal discomfort and pain 
either diarrhea or constipation or both. Usually it's fluctuating day by day and bloating after meals. And that's the typical irritable bowel syndrome. But back to the low FODMAP diet, if you restrict calories to the diet, to the bowel, you restrict calories to the bacteria, less fermentation and less symptoms. So in 2000, you started exploring the idea that IBS could be a bacterial disorder that can be treated with antibiotics. How did you get to this idea? Well, I think what I was always impressed with is that all IBS patients have bloating and they literally would come to the office distended. So how do you get distended with gas if it wasn't produced there? And we know that bacteria in the gut produce a lot of that gas and therefore bloating. Uh, so we began to explore that. And I can tell you that it's not an easy task to take a disease that was thought as a psychosomatic and suddenly teach people microbiology and that it's a microbiological condition. But if you fast forward now to 2022, I think it's extremely well understood that IBS, probably the majority of IBS is a microbiome condition. And we've done a lot it, you know, to contribute to that uh, evolution in this disease. By treating IBS with antibiotics, though, do you not run the risk of compromising the healthy bacteria in the gut? So the antibiotic that we first started to work with was rifaximin, which is a non-absorbed antibiotic. And there was, a, there was a reason that we chose that antibiotic. for It doesn't create much resistance. It, do, it doesn't get absorbed because it doesn't dissolve in water. So it won't affect the colon bacteria. And then it just gets rid of the bacteria that are unusual or abnormally elevated in the small bowel. But it isn't until the last couple of years that we realized how good it is. Um, so we now know that in IBS, you get a buildup of bacteria in the small bowel called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there are two bacteria that are really dominating, E. coli, Klebsiella, and those organisms produce hydrogen. And that's that gas that we were talking about. But those bugs are like bullies in the neighborhood. So the higher they are, the lower everything else is because they're sort of clearing the neighborhood out of good people and only the bullies are left. And then when you give rifaximin, <clears throat> we now know from studies of the small bowel, by reducing the E. coli and Klebsiella, all the neighbors come back to the, to the neighborhood. So it actually, ironically, repopulates the good flora after you've taken it. So in 2015, you created a test capable of diagnosing IBS, which at the time was believed to be predominantly caused by food poisoning. Can you tell me more about this test? Well, we've known since the early 90s that food poisoning could trip off IBS, but we didn't know if it was a true cause or just sort of triggering the illness to be more manifest. Um, but now we know from animal studies and probably over a hundred uh, papers that food poisoning causes IBS about 60% of cases. And we then identified the toxin in food poisoning that was the culprit. So then we could develop a blood test saying, okay, you had that toxin. We can measure antibodies to that toxin in your blood. But we found out that that toxin makes you also form antibodies to yourself, to a protein called vinculin. So by combining two tests, an antibody to the toxin and an antibody to vinculin, we were able to say you have IBS with 98% certainty if the tests are both positive. And that really changes the game because patients think it's, they're told it's in their head. They're told it's not real. They're told it's, uh, it's a functional disease, not an organic disease. But once they have a positive test, we know what caused it and we can get them to treatment. So one of the things that happens with patients is they spend a lot of money, uh, especially in the U.S. with co-pays. They have to, they see the doctor, the doctor says, you need a colonoscopy. You're a 25 year old woman. Do you really need a colonoscopy? If you have IBS, the answer is no, but they do it. But if you did a blood test and it was positive, you're done. Move on, treat. It saves a tremendous amount of healthcare resources. Uh, and so th this is why the test is so important. What about the diagnosis of IBS 
that was not caused by food poisoning? Is the test capable of that kind of diagnosis? So I, I think what we've come to 2022 is that in the diarrhea category of IBS, because there's two sides, there's the constipation and the diarrhea, we know that the antibodies are present in 60%. So we can explain 60%. And because of those antibodies, the gut nerves are diminished and you get a buildup of bacteria in the gut called bacterial overgrowth, which is why these patients respond to antibiotics. On the constipation side, it's a different microbiome effect. There is methane producing organisms that are overabundant. And for, for that, we don't know why. But when they are, the, the methane gas that's produced, which is a different gas, actually slows the gut down, causing constipation. And in that side, about 60% of constipation, IBS, is the methane. But your question is, what about the other 40%? Uh, and so, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done in that group because there may be other reasons. So, uh, it sort of goes back to the beginning of our conversation, which is IBS was the leftover diagnosis after everything was looked for. So obviously, it's going to be a group of diseases. We just need to find out what they are. And the good news is we found out 60% of what it is. And now we need to find out what the other 40% is. What are the steps involved in a healthy person's development of IBS when not caused by food poisoning? Uh, that's a terrific question because we don't understand the transition from normal to IBS if food poisoning isn't part of the process. We just don't. But some people do get overgrowth of bacteria spontaneously, not related to food poisoning, and then we treat that. So the second part of the testing, we talked about the blood test, is to do a breath test. And the breath test is, uh, tells you what type of bacteria you have. And then you can treat that if they have it. But in the, again, 30 or 40% group that's left, we, we look for things like celiac disease. We look for things like uh, mast cell disorders. We look for things uh, like microscopic colitis, which are, does require a colonoscopy. So in essence, the testing, the two tests, the blood test and the breath test, when they're negative, it tells us who to explore or investigate further with more advanced testing. Okay. Is there a congenital component to IBS? So um, congenital, I guess you mean runs in the family, like a genetic con component. Yeah, and also present at birth. Well, I mean, this is very difficult because in childhood, the children cannot tell you what they're experiencing. So I, I literally got off the phone with a pediatric gastroenterologist last night discussing the nuances and differences of quote IBS in children, there isn't even criteria for IBS in children because, especially under the age of five, because they can't describe their symptoms, you can't apply criteria appropriately. There are children who, well, let me say it this way, uh, what we believe IBS and how it manifests in children is more abdominal pain and less the diarrhea and constipation. Uh, and, and we see that even into adolescence, that they tend to be different than the adult population. But how it met, how it develops in children, it's very hard to know. But genetically speaking, we think there is a risk. So if if you food poison, which we wouldn't do, uh, with Campylobacter or Salmonella, common food poisoning that people know about, a hundred people, eleven will develop IBS as an adult, and but eighty nine won't. Why? So maybe they have a genetic protection, or the others have a genetic issue that leads them to be a risk. Correct. So when you talk about congenital, we can talk about genetics and maybe there is a genetic predisposition. And we're, we're starting to get some understanding of that possibility. Then just to close off with, in light of the fact that it's been over two decades since you observed that IBS is in fact not a psychosomatic or psychological disorder, but a bacterial disorder, why do you think that the misconceived idea that IBS is psychosomatic and the resultant treatment of the condition as such 
still reign supreme in the medical fraternity? Well, there, a lot of it has to do with cost. A lot of it has to do with the distribution of rifaximin. For example, in Europe, rifaximin is not EMA approved for IBS. The company never sought that. <clears throat> so I can give you an example. In the, in the U.S., once it was FDA approved, the U.S. converted completely to the notion that IBS was a microbiome condition. More recently, it, the rifaximin was approved in Canada, and all of a sudden, they're converting to uh, a microbiome approach to IBS. Europe hasn't approved rifaximin for IBS yet, and a lot of other parts of the world haven't either. And rifaximin is generally more expensive than an antidepressant or a tricyclic. And so a lot of... Uh, I'm, I'm from Canadian, so I'm very familiar with socialized medicine. And socialized medicine is a cost system. So you want to use the least cost medication first. And, and people tend to gravitate towards the old medications of the 90s, which are very inexpensive. What do you think is behind Europe and other parts of the world's decision not to follow the sound science that you have discovered to treat something that affects as many people as you mentioned? Well, sometimes it's hard for me to understand also. I mean, if you look at the hundreds of papers, including a brilliant uh, study from Australia, which <clears throat> combined all the breath test studies in one paper that shows absolutely convincingly that uh, bacteria are building up in, in IBS. The Mayo Clinic is publishing papers. Europeans are publishing papers. The, the best paper on culturing the small bowel showing SIBO is from Greece. And it showed convincingly that 60% of IBS is build up of bacteria in the small intestine. So I, I still scratch my head. But but the thing is, you have, you have to understand that there are very, very few scientists in the world studying irritable bowel syndrome. And so it's a small cadre of individuals, and depending upon their personalities and their, their opinions, it, it can sway different regions. So we don't have a lot of us doing the pathophysiology of IBS. Dr. Mark Pimentel, thank you so much for your time. I'm not just smart for business.com.